All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Gorowski, and I'll be your host for today. Uh, for those who are new to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we're all about bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms across North America and beyond through virtual speakers, virtual field trips. And we're getting really excited because September is coming soon, and we'll be ramping up to our full program, 30, 40, even 50 live events a month for classrooms. So whether you're at home, whether you're in the classroom or doing a hybrid of both, we have you covered with live events from all over the world. We've been having a ton of fun the last few months. Every Thursday at 10 a.m. Eastern, we've been connecting with the Duke Lemur Center. And we have been learning all about lemurs from fossils um, to the country of Madagascar in general to visiting uh, the lemur forest and getting to meet uh, some of these amazing primates. So. We've got a really exciting event lined up for today. So founded in 1966 on the campus of Duke University in Durham, North Carolina, the Duke Lemur Center is a world leader in the study, care and protection of lemurs, Earth's most threatened group of mammals. With more than 200 animals across 14 species, the Duke Lemur Center houses the world's largest, most diverse population of lemurs outside of their native Madagascar. Today, we're gonna to be joined by paleontologist, Dr. Uh, Matt Bortz. He is the curator of the Lemur Center's Division of Fossil Primates. So he oversees uh, their 30,000 plus specimens. So among uh, the world's largest and most important collection of early primates. And today we're going to join Matt as he explains a little bit about where to look for fossils and where not to look. So Matt, let me bring you in here. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? Great, Matt. It's always great to have you joining us. You've always got all kinds of treasures for us to check out. Uh, it's cool drawers. <laughs> that's right. You've got quite a collection. We're excited to dive in. I'm going to let you take over for a bit. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining in today. Um, and I've certainly learned a lot about the Lemur Center by watching the presentations that we've been doing over the last couple of weeks, just because I've been able to see my colleagues talk about the uh, kinds of expertise that they have. Um, today, I would like to talk to you about a question that I get a lot um, about fossils, which is basically where do we find fossils and how do we know where to look for fossils? Because if I just walked outside and looked in the dirt, um, chances are I'm not going to find a fossil very easily. Um, so somehow paleontologists go out and this collection that's behind me has over 35,000 specimens in it. And so someone knew where to look um, and they knew how to find enough material to bring back here to learn about the ancient past. Um, and so what I'd like to show you today is a little bit kind of behind the scenes of how I work as a paleontologist and how I work with teams of other researchers to figure out where to go and how to find these, this material. And one of the things that uh, is especially hard uh, to figure out is fossils in Madagascar are very frustrating to find. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start my presentation here. Um, and I titled this Finding and Not Finding Fossils in Madagascar. On this picture uh, is some of the fossils that have been found in Madagascar. These are all skulls of lemurs that used to live in Madagascar. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about why those skulls are kind of the exception in the Malagasy fossil record. Uh, so first, just in case you've missed some of the previous presentations from the Duke Lemur Center, um, a quick introduction to who we are. Um, at the Duke Lemur Center, we have fossils, but we also have this living collection of primates that are called lemurs. Lemurs uh, look a little bit, let me see if I can get this video to play. Maybe it doesn't want to right now. That's okay, well, let's go to this slide. Um, so looking at the primate family tree, uh, lemurs are a branch of what are called primates. Primates are a group of animals that also includes monkeys and apes. That means that we, humans, which are a kind of ape, are also part of the primate family tree. Lemurs are really, really, really distantly related to us. Uh, you might first glance at something like this ringtail lemur and look at its striped tail and think it might look a little bit like a raccoon, but in fact, lemurs are part of the same group that includes monkeys and apes and us. Um, the only place where you can find lemurs today is on the island of Madagascar. And Madagascar is uh, an island off the coast of Africa. And it's all the way, and take a look at a world map. 
down here off the coast of Africa. I'm speaking to you from North Carolina all the way here. Um, and we have to travel all the way down here to this island off the coast of Africa to study lemurs and to understand where they came from. Now, if we want to figure out where lemurs came from on the island of Madagascar, we have to study their fossils. If we go to the island of Madagascar, we find fossils, some fossils. Uh, this is what's called the geological time scale. And the geological time scale is a way that researchers who study the Earth's ancient past divide the past up into sections that we can talk about more easily. So some of these might be kind of familiar, things like the Jurassic, the Triassic, and the Cretaceous are all part of the Mesozoic era. That's the time of the dinosaurs. Then when the dinosaur, non-avian dinosaurs go extinct at the end of the Cretaceous, we get into the Cenozoic period. This is called the age of mammals sometimes because this is when mammals really get started about 66 million years ago as a diversifying group that's really important for uh, larger ecosystems around the world. If you go to Madagascar, you can find fossils from the very end of the age of dinosaurs. They're about 65, they're about 66 to 67 million years old. Those fossils include things like this uh, picture of Majungasaurus's teeth. Um, we walk out into the open badlands of Madagascar to find these. And I actually wanna share with you um, where on a world map where that is so i am going to share with you earth which is a really powerful tool actually used for um, all kinds of research around the world geologists geographers um, biologists use this program to understand how the world is uh, related to each other what we're looking at here is the island of madagascar so if you're around the globe there's africa and we can zoom in to Madagascar, where we find the dinosaur fossils uh, from the late Cretaceous in Madagascar is down here um, in the town of Brief. And so it's in the northwestern part of Madagascar. And so you can see that there's this big river that's flowing through the area. And as we zoom in on Brief, there's all these badlands exposed around the area. Um, where fossils have been discovered in Madagascar. When we zoom out, we can look at the rest of Madagascar, and you can see from these pictures that were taken from space that the right side of Madagascar, the east side of Madagascar, is very, very green. This is where a whole lot of the diversity of Madagascar is found. A lot of lemurs are found in this area because this is where all the forests are. It's really dense with forests. The middle part of Madagascar is much more dry. And this is a highlands, it's basically a grassland. You don't find a lot of lemurs living in that area. Instead, lemurs kind of rim around the edges of Madagascar. Um, and when we go into the past of Madagascar, we discover that, um, sorry, I'm gonna go back to my presentation, that the dinosaurs of Madagascar are really amazing. Um, including things like this creature called Majungasaurus. So this is about 66 million year old animal that is found uh, in Madagascar. It looks a little bit like Tyrannosaurus rex because it has these long back legs and really, really short front legs. Its front legs are actually even smaller relative to its body than the arms of Tyrannosaurus rex. So people like to make fun of the arms of T-Rex for being really small. But Majungasaurus had even smaller arms. But you didn't want to make fun of this animal to its face because it had this really stumpy face that's kind of built like a bulldog and it's super sharp teeth that are in that mouth that was used and it kind of made it the top predator of Madagascar 66 million years ago. Sharing the landscape with Majungasaurus was an animal like Mashikasaurus. Mashikasaurus is a smaller animal um, closer in size to something like a dromaeosaur, like the raptors that you think of. Um, this doesn't have a claw on its foot, but it does have teeth that are pointing forward out of its mouth. It's almost like this kind of circular saw that's sticking out of the front of its face. And this also would have been a smaller predator that would have been a top predator in ancient Madagascar. Another big predator that lived at the time is Biesel bufo, which means the devil toad. And the devil toad was a 
animal that lived during the time of the dinosaurs. It was big enough that paleontologists think it would have been able to eat baby dinosaurs as it was roaming around the world. So this was another kind of top predator for small animals that lived in Madagascar 66 million years ago. More gentle animals include Rapetosaurus, which is a long necked sauropod dinosaur that lived in Madagascar. And then surrounding these dinosaurs were other animals that included things like crocodiles, things like a Rarapasuchus, which is this coyote-like running crocodile, or Majungasaurus, uh, or Majungasuchus, this really big uh, kind of fat-faced uh, crocodile that had teeth that were kind of these like super like fat <laughs> puncturing teeth that would have been really, really uh, devastating if you got a bite from it. Um, it would have been really good at cracking through bone. And then there were things like Simasuchus. Simasuchus is a small, almost armadillo-like crocodile that liked to eat plants. It has a stumpy face and a stumpy tail and was covered in armor. Um, and it's one of the only plant-eating crocodiles that we've ever discovered. And this animal, it was part of this landscape 66 million years ago in Madagascar. So we have all these weird characters living in Madagascar 66 million years ago. So of course we wanna find out what happens next. We wanna find out after these animals go extinct, after dinosaurs go extinct 66 million years ago, then what happens? Well, the way to figure out what happens is to go look for rocks that preserve fossils that are from the time period after the age of dinosaurs. That would tell us what was going on in Madagascar after their extinction. Unfortunately, we have yet to find any fossils from land-based environments in Madagascar from any time between the extinction of the dinosaurs and about, we think like 28,000 years ago, some fossils have been found that might be as old as 80,000 years old, but that's 80,000 years ago. 80,000 years is a really, really long time ago in human time, but in Earth's history, uh, 80,000 years ago is really not very long ago at all. Um, Homo sapiens, our species, was around 80,000 years ago. And most of the fossils that we find in Madagascar um, are from a much more recent time period, um, some as young as 300 years old. So we want to fill in the gap. We want to figure out what was going on in Madagascar during this time period. Um, some of these animals that are from the very recent past of Madagascar are really fascinating. And I'll show you some of these fossils in, in a little bit. Actually, I can show you some of them right now. Um, so these are the uh, skulls of things like archaeolemur, which if you're interested in learning more about these animals, you feel free to ask me questions when we pause for that, or watch some of the previous presentations where I really go into the biology of these animals. So this is an extinct giant lemur that lived in Madagascar, and we think only went extinct a couple of hundred years ago. Living alongside archaeolemur would have been megalatopus. This is another lemur that is the size of, this is a small one. Um, this would have been uh, about the size of a golden retriever. Um, there's other species of megalatopus that were as large as a gorilla, which is the largest primate that's alive today. So we have these giant lemurs that are living in Madagascar only a few centuries ago. Uh, there are people building castles in uh, places like Europe um, when these animals we think were still alive. Um, so going back to the presentation, um, here's a reconstruction of what we think megalatopus would have looked like. Um, it's this kind of big gorilla-like lemur. And so we want to figure out where megalatopus came from and where uh, archaeolemur came from and all these other creatures that were once part of ancient Madagascar. The other really important thing that happens at some time between the extinction of the dinosaurs and the evolution of animals like megalatopus and archaeolemur is all of these animals arrive in Madagascar. As far as we can tell, looking at the fossil record from the end of the age of dinosaurs in Madagascar, nothing that was alive in Madagascar during the time of the dinosaurs is part of modern Madagascar ecosystems. No, none of the birds, none of the frogs, uh, obviously we have no dinosaurs uh, that are still living there except for the birds. Um, so, all the animals and all the plants that are in Madagascar today had to get there after the extinction of the dinosaurs. 
We think that a lot of animals arrived in Madagascar at a really crucial period between about 40 million years ago and 20 million years ago. This is when a lot of the mammal groups arrived on the island of Madagascar, and we think that they came from the continent of Africa. The evidence for that includes the fossil relatives of Malagasy animals are found in Africa. Um, and then molecular evidence suggests that they arrived in Madagascar between 40 and 20 million years ago. So what we can do is we can take an animal at the top here. This is an animal called a tenrec. Tenrec, uh, tenrecs look a little bit like shrews. This one looks a little bit like a uh, really punk um, hedgehog. And um, this animal has relatives that live in Africa. Um, there's one kind of tenrec that still lives there. When we compare the DNA of tenrecs that live in Madagascar to tenrecs that live in Africa, it suggests that their, their genetic codes kind of separated at some time between 40 million years ago and 20 million years ago. We can do the same thing with carnivores that live in Madagascar. They're animals called fusas. Fusas are relatives of mongooses. So things like meerkats that live in Africa are the closest relatives that we have of the carnivores that live in Madagascar today. Again, comparing their genetic code, we think that the separation between mongooses like meerkats and animals like fusas was about 20 million years ago. And then of course, lemurs arrive in Madagascar and their genetic code is kind of all over the place. Um, and the separation between uh, lemurs in Madagascar and the primates that were living in Africa, um, we think uh, suggests that these animals arrived in Madagascar a long time ago, about 40 million years ago. Um, they may have arrived as early as 60 million years ago, and they may have gotten there as recently as 20 million years ago. So there's all these, that's tens of millions of years of separation that we have. Like we have really imprecise dates for when the modern Madagascar ecosystem all got put together. And it would be great if we could figure out what was going on during that time period. Um, and so far, we don't have it. We don't have fossils from the time period between 66 million years ago and about 80,000 years ago. So paleontologists are still searching to fill in that gap on the island of Madagascar. But of course the question is, why are we missing this time? The answer for why we find uh, some fossils, like we find dinosaur fossils in Madagascar, and then we find the fossils of things like Megalaticus in the much more recent record, is all connected to the science of geology. Geology is the study of Earth, of Earth, basically. So it's a study of rocks is usually how we think about it. But rocks are studied by geologists because they tell us about how the Earth was put together. And one of the branches of geology that's really important for telling us where fossils can be found is uh, a branch of uh, paleontology of geology called physical geology. That's the study of the surface of the Earth and the study particularly of plate tectonics. Plate tectonics are uh, basically the study of how our Earth is not as stable as we'd like it to be. The surface of the planet is actually cracked. Um, and this map is showing you where the borders between all of the big continental uh, chunks are located. And so these cracks in the Earth let the surface of the Earth move around. It moves really, really, really slowly. Um, and over time, the surface of the Earth has changed as the surface of the planet, these plates, glide along the top of what's called the mantle. The mantle is the kind of moving part of the inner part of our planet. The crust, which is the outer part, is the, where we find the plates, and it's really, really thin relative to the whole density of the Earth. So these plates have been drifting around on the surface of the planet for uh, millions and millions and millions of years. And so I'm gonna show you a animation of what the changes on the planet look like over the course of the last about 500 million years. So this was put together by a researcher named uh, Christopher Scatiz, who's one of the great kind of paleogeographers. Um, when we look at this video, uh, down here, this red dot, is the city of Chicago through time. It starts about 500 million years ago, which is the beginning of when life really starts to get complicated, when life starts to get multiple cells. And we start to find a fossil record 
um, of all kinds of different plants and animals. So Chicago starts south of the equator. Um, this is basically like looking at the equator here, the middle part of the planet. This is where someday the North Pole is going to be and Antarctica is going to be down here. But it's not there yet because the plates have to move across the planet. Um, I know a lot of our viewers from Exploring by the Sea or Pants are also in Canada. Um, and up here is the Canadian plate, which has all this green stuff here. These are some of the first um, chunks of these plates that are exposed to the surface. And so some of the oldest fossils that we find uh, with multicellular life are found in parts of Canada because Canada was exposed on the surface and had beaches along the side, um, whereas a lot of the world was still uh, underwater where we're living today. Um, what you can see on this light blue is basically shallow seas. And those shallow seas are gonna be really important for part of the fossil record of Madagascar. So as we move through time, these darker strips are where you see mountains forming. Mountains form when plates of uh, the uh, when plates on the surface of the planet collide with each other. When there's a crash between two continents, the result of that is a mountain chain. And so, as you watch these brown strips pop up, you can see that then the green, the low lying area, is surrounding where the mountains pop up because mountains uplift big chunks of the Earth. And then those mountains create an area where more rock can form. That's gonna be really important for the story of where we find fossils today. So right here is a mountain chain that's forming between what will someday be Africa down here in the South and what will someday be North America in the North and what will someday be Europe off to the East. So Europe, Africa, and North America were all connected and in a big mountain chain was the result of the collision between all these continents. We call that mountain chain today the Appalachian Mountains in North America. And the Appalachian Mountains were really important uh, for providing a lot of the uh, surface and land that we find um, in uh, the east coast of the United States and the rest of North America. So I'm speaking to you now from Durham, North Carolina. Um, and in the time period I'm frozen on here is when a lot of the fossils that I'm sitting on right now uh, were deposited. There are fossils here in Durham from the beginning of the age of dinosaurs. Um, and those were deposited from the flanks of the Appalachian Mountains. At this point, we're looking at a lot of these continents are connected to each other. If you've heard of the continent of Pangaea, when the continents were all kind, you could walk from Antarctica all the way to China. Um, that's this time period we're looking at. But then Pangaea breaks apart and it breaks into two big continents. The northern continent is called Laurasia, and Laurasia includes North America, Asia, and Europe. The southern continents are called Gondwana, and Gondwana includes South America, Europe, Madagascar, uh, Australia, uh, India, and Antarctica. What you can see here is Africa as a continent is still connected to South America, but Madagascar, is breaking away from Africa. So Madagascar has been separate from the continent of Africa for over a hundred million years, but it's still connected to India. Eventually the continent of India, Madagascar breaks apart and Madagascar is left behind. India is gonna go all the way to the north and it's going to collide with Asia, leaving Madagascar behind in the Indian Ocean. At this point, nothing is going to smash into Madagascar. And that's really important that Madagascar doesn't have any continents running into it, which means no mountains are gonna be built in Madagascar for the rest of the time that Madagascar is an island continent off of Africa. There you see the collision between India and Asia and the Himalayan mountains pop up. And so now we're getting close to the modern world. And then the ice ages, start to uh, go forward and backward. So, if we go to uh, what's going on under the planet, we get plate collisions happening, plate collisions slam into each other. And the reason they cause mountains is because as one plate smashes into another one, and often one will slide underneath the other, we get 
volcanoes. We get parts of those plates and parts of the mantle of the earth start to heat up. As heated things uh, get warmer, they expand. And as they expand, so that expansion has to go somewhere and often it goes up. And so we get mountains forming um, where these collisions are happening. We also get volcanoes. And that uplift is really important because when you get uplift, you get new rock getting pushed up into the uh, into space. And what happens uh, as mountains form is evaporation off of oceans and other bodies of water then goes over the mountains. Mountains cause the water to condense and you get rain. Rain in high parts of the world is going to want to run to the low parts of the world. Water flows downhill. And as it flows downhill, it forms first streams, which are very small runoff tributaries that then combine into river systems. And those river systems bring with them uh, little pieces of the mountain. Basically, the mountains break down into sand and they break down into dirt. And all of that gets dragged out by water out into the lower lying parts of the continent. Those low lying parts of the continent then start to get built up with all of this little bits of what used to be mountains, but are now uh, basically big sandbars. That is called sandstone. Now, if we zoom in on what's going on um, down here below the surface, this plate has snapped in half and is starting to rise again. That uplift that's happening again pushes all the sand that's been deposited off the mountains up into the air again. The rivers that are crossing through it erode away at the sandstone, exposing the layers of uh, rock that were laid down over millions of years coming off of the mountains. So if you want to find fossils, you're going to find fossils that are deposited along with rock in the sedimentary sandstones and other uh, kinds of rock that are formed by water. And so while we're getting all of this erosion off the mountains, animals are living out here. When they die, their bones and teeth and footprints um, and the parts of plants that are living out there will also get deposited in the rock too. But when we find fossils, we're finding them in this material that's basically put down by mountains breaking down over time. This is a map of North America showing us the geology of North America. What you see going through the middle of North America is all these dark colors. These dark colors represent rocks that were basically put down um, through some kind of mountain building event. And the mountains on the sides of them, you see these big erosional surfaces. So the Rocky Mountains are a really important mountain chain in the western part of North America. And all, as the Rocky Mountains have eroded, they have deposited all kinds of sandstone through the middle part of North America. So if you think of where the plains are today in North America, kind of flat-lying parts of the world, those plains were created as the Rocky Mountains eroded and rivers flowed out of those mountains into the middle part of the continent and brought with them lots and lots of material that gets deposited along with fossils. So the reason that we find fossils in the western part of North America, places like Alberta and places like Wyoming and places like Colorado, is because those are close to where the mountains were eroding. The Rocky Mountains were uplifted during the end of the age of dinosaurs and the beginning of the age of mammals, which means the fossils that we find that are deposited by the eroding Rocky Mountains in North America are from the time period when the Rocky Mountains were being pushed up and then breaking down again. And so out here is where we can find the fossils of things like uh, from the beginning of the age of mammals. So this is a close up of the state of Wyoming where we find a lot of fossils right here at the Duke Lemur Center. Again, dark colors are mountains. And this orange area is called the Bridger Basin. The Bridger Basin was basically deposited as the mountains here to the west, which are part of the Rocky Mountains, broke down and put fossils and new rock into this orange patch. The reason that we go out there is because these mountains here in the background were breaking down and depositing all of this uh, nice water, which then brought with it rock, during the beginning of the age of mammals, when things like lemurs were first starting to appear in the fossil record. And so we go out west to look for these animals. And it's really kind of perfect that the Rocky Mountains were popping up during a time period when we as paleontologists are really interested in the beginning of lemur evolution. This is a picture of what Wyoming looks like right now. 
You can see these layers that were put down by flooding events and rivers and streams during this time period about 50 million years ago. So these layers that you see are basically just flood events that are stacked on top of each other. The reason we can see them today is because this whole area got uplifted again and then eroded again by water, kind of creating these slices through the rock. Here's another really beautiful picture of these cross sections through rock. This is from um, where I come from in Cincinnati, Ohio. The problem with Cincinnati, Ohio is that the only time that you can see these beautiful layers of rock is when there's a highway or when a river cuts through it. Because Cincinnati, like much of Eastern North America, is covered in beautiful green forests and grasslands. And so it's really hard to see the fossils because they're covered in dirt. Wyoming is different because Wyoming today is really dry. And so we go to dry places to look for fossils because uh, fossils aren't that common. Um, if you go 10 feet to pick up a fossil, um, here, it's not that hard to walk 10 feet from place to place if you find a fossil. In Cincinnati, it's a lot harder to walk 10 feet to 10 feet because there's all this green stuff on top of it. That's really important um, for going to other green places to look for fossils. Madagascar is very green, and there's not a lot of beautiful exposure of rocks. Um, this is another green place where we've done some fossil hunting. Um, this is in South America. Um, a team led by Dr. Lauren Gonzalez leads this team. And one of the reasons that we find uh, fossils in South America is because South America also has a really beautiful island chain or a uh, mountain chain that was built up called the Andes Mountains. The Andes um, popped up during a time period when, let's see, I'm going to go ahead. during a time period when the early relatives of monkeys in South America were really getting started. So here is an aerial view of South America. These are the Andes Mountains. The, the Pacific Plate has slammed into South America, uplifted all of this. And over time, the rivers are breaking down those mountains and depositing all of that material through the Amazon River Basin. So the rivers that we go to in Peru um, preserve fossils because here are the mountains. This is the city of Cusco, which is in Peru. It's basically at the top of the mountains. We drive down the mountains into the river system, and this is where we find fossils because new rock is eroded off the top of the mountains and put down here. The problem is that when you go to Madagascar, you don't have mountains that then got eroded and deposited new fossil material, and then you don't have those fossils exposed again on the surface. So now it's time to zoom over to Madagascar, where we are missing our fossil record between the extinction of the age of dinosaurs and the recent fossil past. Now, fortunately, we do have fossils um, from some time period recent, and that's about 80,000 years ago to about 300 years ago. Um, we do have part of the fossil record. Um, and that is what's called the recent or Holocene fossil record of Madagascar. And so now I want to show you why we have those fossils, because those fossils are really special. Most of the ones where we find lemurs are found in a type of rock um, that is called limestone. So limestone is a special rock that's formed in shallow seas. It's basically the carcasses of lots of microscopic um, and small organisms that rain out of the water. After the animals that are living up here in the water column die, their uh, shells basically rain to the bottom, creating layers of beautiful rock called limestone. Limestone um, can then get exposed on the surface. So in Madagascar, these limestones that formed in shallow seas that were close to Madagascar <laughs> did get uplifted by um, tectonic plates in Madagascar. Those limestones are now exposed on the surface. One of the things that's kind of cool about limestone is that it dissolves. In rain and water, uh, which is a little bit acidic, that acidic water can actually break down limestone and water can actually flow into limestone and go underwater. When those underwater uh, wearing, basically like wearing sites, or at least like pockets get worn away in limestone, if those dry out and they erode to the surface, we call them caves. And a cave is basically a hole in limestone where uh, we can walk into it. And these caves 
become really important for the fossil record of Madagascar because the limestone that we find might have been made hundreds or tens of millions of years ago, but the caves are much more recent because the limestone had to be uplifted and then it had to get worn away by rain and water. Those pockets in limestone get exposed to the surface. And when that happens, animals might go into it. Uh, caves are really important for all kinds of creatures because they're a safe place. The climate is pretty constant. Um, and if you're a predator, it's a good place to bring your kill to kind of keep it safe from other predators. And so these caves that formed in Madagascar, um, in places like the Ankarna Reserve in northern or northwestern Madagascar. This is all limestone. And all of this limestone has been carved away by water that is kind of eating away at the limestone platform. And in all of these cuts, you can see this is basically canyons, are caves. And in those caves, we find these spectacular fossils of recent animals that fell into these caves. Um, and were picked up by paleontologists so we can study them. So this is at a cave called Antiki Kalo in, um, or Achille Talo, um, in southwestern Madagascar. It's basically a huge pit. It's like 145 meters deep. And so cavers repel into this cave. They go down and basically fill their bags and buckets with fossils. They then bring those fossils out of the cave at the end of the day, where paleontologists sort through that material we have thousands of fossils from these caves in Madagascar that tell us about what the world of Madagascar looked like. Um, only in this case, in Kiritalo was deposited between 500 and 300 years ago. And so in those caves, we find animals um, that tell us about how Madagascar has changed only in the last few centuries. There's another spectacular site in southwestern Madagascar called Simon Pit Suits. Uh, this is a project that um, I'm not directly involved in, but I really want to tell you about. It's led by uh, researcher Lori Godfrey, um, along with Kathleen Muldoon and Brooke Crawley and um, Lovo uh, Ranova Harmana, they, who's a Malagasy researcher. And this is an underwater cave site. The water is still in the cave, it's still wearing away at the limestone. Except the paleontologists that include uh, people like Zachary Klukart, who's a paleontologist and a cave diver, are able to go into this cave where they find fossils of animals that only went extinct a couple centuries ago. So this is a crocodile um, that has horns that was living in this cave. Um, they drop down and bring, basically bring their fossils to the cave edge, and then paleontologists are able to sort through them. And that includes the subfossils of things like lemurs. And so um, with that, uh, today we know that the fossil record of Madagascar isn't very complete, um, but we at least can tell you the story of what happened in Madagascar as things like Megalatopus and Archaeolemur went extinct. Um, but we need to fill in the gap. We need to figure out what the ancestors of Megalatopus looked like. What was going on as these animals first arrived on the island? Um, and the reason we haven't found it and hasn't been very easy for us to fill in those gaps is because of the plate tectonics of Madagascar that caused the fossils in Madagascar um, to not necessarily be easy to find that fill in that time period. Um, so I know that that was a, a long explanation um, because there's a lot of detailed geology. And so now I'd like to stop and see if you guys have any questions for me um, about geology or fossil hunting in Madagascar or really anywhere else in the world. All right. Thanks, Matt, for taking us on that journey around the world, uh, teaching us a little bit about where to find fossils, how they form. I think that was that was awesome. We spent a few times looking at the amazing collection, and it's really cool to see where they came from and, and how you found them. So thanks for sharing that with us today. All right. Well, we have Ethan and Isaac. They are joining us uh, in Wisconsin. They sent a question in via the chat, but I'm going to pop them in in case they want to ask it live. So let me open that up there. Hey, Wisconsin, how you doing? Hi. Hi, it's great to see you. <laughs> great, to, great to attend this one. This is a fantastic. Um, do you want to ask a question? Oh, yeah. This is Isaac. He has a question. Hi, about, Isaac. Yeah. A name? The Jandalima. You want to see? What did the giant lemurs eat? That is a really important question. When we study animals, we want to figure out what they were eating because that tells us a lot about their biology. And the best way to figure out what they were eating is by looking at their teeth. And the way that we can figure out what animals were eating, so this is Megalatopus, which is this giant lemur. 
that we think, based on how its teeth are put together, that this animal loved to eat leaves. And so when you look at the teeth of this animal, it has these big, sharp crests on it. Um, and those sharp crests are something, when you think of sharp teeth, you might think of things that like to eat meat. But if you want to eat a lot of leaves, you need sharp teeth too, because you need to slice through those leaves and get the nutrients out of it really quickly. And so we think that things like megalatopus ate leaves. Um, we think that animals like archaeolemur, which is uh, the kind of big, we call it the monkey lemur, because when you look at its teeth, this animal is actually a little bit of a mystery. Um, its teeth look a lot like a monkey. Monkeys have really big fat teeth that let them eat basically whatever they want, especially hard objects. And so we think that archaeolemur would have been an animal that ate things like um, uh, roots of plants. Um, maybe it also ate seeds and fruit. Um, so this would have been an animal that really could have eaten whatever it wanted um, because it has these really big omnivore teeth that actually look a little bit like the teeth that you and me have too. Um, so giant lemurs were mostly eating things like leaves and they were eating things like fruits um, that lemurs, like small lemurs also eat today. Oh, thank you so much. Thank so, you. <laughs> you mentioned that they were um, castles in Europe. They, yeah. they put in the castles to, to be against the lemurs? No, um, so that's just to, to emphasize how recent these fossils are. Oh. Um, so. Usually when, when I think of fossils, I think of something like T-Rex, which is 66 million years ago, or I think of something like a saber-toothed cat, which went extinct you know, thousands of years ago. And so humans were around when like, mammoths and saber-toothed cats were around, but you know we, we were living in pretty simple societies and we weren't building very complicated structures yet. Um, what's amazing about the fossils that I can show here, so things like megalatopus, this fossil, we know how old this fossil is, it's about 500 years old. So 500 years ago, like in 1500 um, in Europe, there are people who are like, we're basically in the Renaissance. Like there are people uh, trying to figure out how to write, like, like Dante's Inferno has already been written. And this animal is living in Madagascar during that time period. There are also people who are living in Madagascar who also built castles, um, but they, uh, they, that would have happened a little bit after we think these animals went extinct. So in Madagascar, there were also really complicated societies, um, but those are probably castles built against people um, as different groups of people were trying to uh, get land for each other and not necessarily to keep the lemurs out. We, so we live in Wisconsin, the, um, uh, in Verona. So mm -hmm. we have an Ice Age Trail. Yes. And we went there, we see the mountains and the hills and the rocks are really different, like, do you want to show? Is it oh, possible? yeah, yeah, yeah. Is possible there are uh, fossils? Uh, yes, there are definitely fossils in, that looks like a piece of chert, which is uh, deposited, usually it's it's in this kind of uh, river system. Um, oh, it's really silica good. that comes out of, out of rock. It's dissolved by water and then mm -hmm. laid down, um, and it's basically parts of sand that get deposited. Mm -hmm. um, so it's possible, that there are fossils in that rock. Oh, um, this one? I don't, <laughs> um, in both, in either of them, although they'd be really small. Um, the fossils that you have in uh, Wisconsin are either Ice Age fossils, which is also true of a lot of the part of the middle part of the country where the Ice Age, where the glaciers came through um, and deposited a lot of sand. And so we get lots of things like woolly mammoths, we get things like mastodons, we get things like saber-toothed cats. But then underneath that is really old rock. Um, and so things like trilobites and things like ancient clams and starfish and ancient fish are the kinds of things that you're likely to find in places like Wisconsin. That's pretty cool. You'll find All a right. local. Very cool. Thanks for and I suggest questions. looking up local fossil clubs. Mm -hmm. um, if you type in um, like Wisconsin Fossil Club, um, oh. fossil clubs tend to be really good at telling you where you can find fossils and how to identify the fossils that you find wherever you live. Oh, my. Thank you so much. <laughs> we'll do that. <laughs> All right. Very cool. So uh, just a reminder to those tuning in via YouTube and Facebook, you can use the chat in both to send us in a question or two. And we'll make sure we work them in. But I'm going to jump to Akash now. Akash is joining us in India. Hey, Akash, Hi. how you doing? Well, it was a nice presentation. It, it really interested me. Uh, okay. Something which is making me curious is that how is the fossils of Lumer used as a basis to tell how the lumen looks, its nature, its color. Does it tell us about 
it's being solitary or nocturnal yes so we we try to uh, paleontologists try to get as much information as we possibly can <laughs> out of everything and part of the way we do that is by studying living animals um, because there's a lot of patterns and a lot of similarities between animals that behave um, and have the same anatomy as an animal we might find in the fossil record. And so with the subfossil lemurs, um, a lot of the comparisons that we make are to living lemurs. Um, and so when it comes to things like reconstructing their color, um, we observe that lemurs tend to be um, lighter on their stomachs and darker on their backs. That's called counter shaking. And that's something that a lot of animals have, especially animals that either live in water. So you think of things like whales um, and fish that have light stomachs and dark backs because it's darker if you're looking down on it and it's lighter if you're looking up and you're kind of backlit by the sun. It's a way to camouflage. We think that animals like lemurs that live in trees um, are doing a little bit of that, that they're able to kind of use shadows um, by having dark backs and light stomachs. So we think that a lot of these subfossil lemurs, as far as color goes, they probably would have had something like that. Um, getting more precise as far as color goes is really hard. Um, short of us uh, being able to get ancient DNA out of these and eventually being able to get a coloration. Um, but I think that's a couple of, of decades away. And that's an area of research that people watching who might be interested in paleontology, um, definitely there's a lot of work to do in figuring out how to combine genetics with a lot of paleontology. Um, we also can use things like the way their brains are put together and how big their eyes are to figure out what time of day they would have been active. Um, so nocturnal animals tend to have really big eyes compared to their brain size. Um, and diurnal animals, animals that are alive during the day, have smaller eyes. And so that tells us that something like archaeolemur um, would have been, this is an animal that lived during the day um, because its eyes are relatively small um, compared to the rest of its head. Um, an animal like an eye eye has much larger eyes compared to its brain. Um, that tells us that it's a nocturnal animal. As far as we can tell, um, the subfossil lemurs uh, were mostly animals that lived during the day, except for the giant eye eye, which is an eye eye that was twice the size of modern eye eye, um, which is huge. And so an eye eye's hand has this like, has really, really long fingers. Its fourth finger and its third finger in particular are really, really long. And its third finger is this tiny stick-like thing. Um, if I had eye eye hands, my hands would be like this long, like going out this far. And so a giant eye eye uh, would have had like the largest, creepiest hands of any animal alive. Um, and that was definitely a, a nocturnal animal as far as we can tell. But besides that, the rest of them we think live during the day, which also might have made them vulnerable to people um, who are competing with them for resources um, as humans in Madagascar started to expand across the island um, and needed more resources for their expanding families. Okay, I have an another end end question. Does bone marrow last? Can you find bone marrow in? Can you find bone marrow in the bones? Yes. So that's one of the amazing things because the this material is so recent. Um, a lot of it is actually still bone. So um, this is um, a skull of a lemur that comes from a cave in uh, northern Madagascar, and it's covered in what's called flow stone. Flowstone is basically like the dissolving limestone that then gets in the water that's eroding the cave. And then that limestone gets redeposited on the floor of the cave. If there's something else on the floor of the cave, like the skeleton of an archaeolemur, that flowstone is going to cover this skull. So this is basically a skull that's encrusted in rock. In order to get this out of the cave, this skull had to be broken off of the bottom of the cave. And so here is actually the inside of the bone of this lemur that was bro broken off. And one of the things that makes it really hard, the reason that this skull is still covered in rock is because the rock is really, really hard. It's limestone. But the bone hasn't been replaced. This is such a recent find that the bone hasn't been replaced by minerals that are dissolved into the bone. And so it's really hard for us to remove the rock without damaging the bone inside. And so these fossils, this one is probably about like 1,000 to 1,500 years old. Um, this is still bone that's inside of it because bone can survive for that long. Um, things like the 66 million year old dinosaur bones, that is mostly minerals that have replaced it. But we're learning a lot about how fossilization happens. And we're discovering that organic material, the proteins that make up bone, um, and the proteins that make up muscle and other kinds of tissue can actually survive um, fossilized by uh, rock for a really, really long period of time. And so we're still learning how this process works. 
All right, great questions, Akash. I'm gonna squeeze in two from uh, online, Max. The first one's from Pamela. She's watching with her grandson, Max. Max is five. And Max wants to know, how big would a giant lemur be if he was standing next to it? So compared to a child. If standing next to a, a five-year-old, a giant lemur, there are a couple different giant lemurs. Um, one giant lemur, uh, like archaeolemur, would be about the size of a five-year-old. Um, Megalatopus, I'll walk you over to the big skull of Megalatopus that we have. Um, this Megalatopus species um, is the size of a gorilla. And so that's an animal that, as far as we can tell, um, Megalatopus, you know, it's, it would have been like, if I was standing next to it, its skull would have, its head would have come up about this high, so like up to my chest. And so that makes it taller than a five-year-old probably. And it would have weighed, we think, about 200 pounds to 240 pounds. So it also weighs a lot of five-year-olds. So it's a big animal. Um, another animal that we have is Paleopropithecus, which is called the sloth lemur. And Paleopropithecus is about the size of a five-year-old. And so this is the skeleton of Paleopropithecus. And so we can zoom in. This is my hand next to its head. And so um, compared to my hand, um, it's an animal. I, I like to think of this as basically um, a German shepherd sized animal that was really good at hanging upside down from the trees. This is a leaf eating animal um, that also only went extinct, we think in the last 300 or 500 years. All right. So one more question here from YouTube. Um, there's definitely interest in finding fossils in local areas. So when yeah. you were talking to Ethan and Isaac, you mentioned uh, looking for a local fossil club. Is there any other advice you'd have for someone who wants to get out and explore their area? So um, learning what kinds of rocks are under your feet is really important for figuring out what kinds of fossils you can find. And there are a lot of ways that you can do that. Um, and uh, there's a lot of resources online. So um, one of my favorite ways, the way that I figure out what's under my feet whenever I travel, is there's an app um, that if uh, you're able to download it, called Rocked, Rock R O C K D. Um, Rocked is a project that a group of geologists put together where they put paleontology data together with geological data. Um, it uses whatever location you're in to show you a geological map of your area and what's under your feet right now. Um, so if you download Rocked, Rocked then has uh, lots of resources inside of it that point you towards uh, field guides and point you towards uh, research projects that describe the fossils and the rocks of basically anywhere in the world. Like I used Rocked when I was in Madagascar and I used it when I was in South America. Um, and it, it gave me the basics of where I was. The other thing that you can do is go to uh, whatever natural history museum is closest to you. Um, there, the curators and researchers who are part of the museum, you, they know your area really well. Um, and they can help point you towards uh, places where you can find fossils. They can also point you towards some really fascinating geological structures if you live in a place um, that has more mountain-like rocks and not as many fossils. There's still a lot you can learn about how your part of the world um, was formed and uh, what its geological history was like. So museums and then rocked is amazing. <laughs> All right, very cool. Well, I want to give a shout out to everybody who tuned in with us on Facebook and YouTube today. Uh, shout out to our groups in Wisconsin and India who hung out uh, live with us today. And of course, Matt, a huge thank you to you and, and the Duke Lemur Center. We love these events. Um, we're always learning more and more from, um, you know, seeing the lemurs in the forests to seeing how the fossils are taken out of the rock. It's been a ton of fun uh, and we can't wait for our next uh, connection, uh, which yeah. I believe will be 10 a.m. next Thursday. Um, we don't know the topic for sure yet. There was talk of maybe heading out to the lemur forest, so that would be a lot of fun. Yeah, that's always a blast, and I, I definitely will be tuning in for that. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for uh, your attention and your questions especially. Um, feel free to, if you have other questions about the stuff I talked about or you need to be pointed towards other resources, um, you can find my contact information at lemur.duke.edu um, to find out more about the Lemur Center and uh, to get answers to your questions about lemurs and everything else. So thank you so much for your time. This is always a lot of fun. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week, and we'll see you next week. Bye.